Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to CIC's October webinar for 2022. Um, during Black History Month, it's an important time for us to consider where this difference and similarity comes into play in every part of our working lives and our personal lives. Um, I'm going to pass over to Yvonne now and I'll let you introduce yourself Yvonne and yeah we'll take it from there but please do keep talking to us in the chat, send us your comments, your questions, talk to each other, discuss things. This is a really open session, it's so pleasing to see so many of you on camera. Um, so without further ado welcome to Yvonne, thanks for being here and hello. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Harry, for inviting me here. Um, so you all know my name. I'm a psychotherapist, but I'm also a racial justice storyteller. Um, so I'm here today to celebrate uh, Black history, not like we need a particular month to celebrate, celebrate it, but I'm here today. So during this webinar, I'm going to talk about the importance of freedom, power and control. And I'm going to use my own lived experience to demonstrate this. And my experience is unique to me. Therefore, I'm not expecting anybody else to identify with it. Having said that, I would expect many of you, whether you've got clients, uh, whether, you know, employees, or whatever may be able to identify with the theme freedom power and control so i will speak for about 15 20 minutes i don't want to hijack it so i want to give you all the freedom the power and control to to speak um so i will open up um the conversation to everybody to talk about um how we move forward um, or just to talk about generally, does it have to be relating to race, um, but just topics in general um, around freedom, power and control. Towards the end, um, I will play some music and we can have a little dance <laughs> for about a minute and a half. Um, oh, in your chairs. And that's basically for a time of reflection. And then after that, um, I'll ask you to just reflect with a few words, um, taking in, you know, bearing in mind the theme, the freedom, power and control, and just say whatever comes to your mind. That's if you want to. And then um, the webinar will come to a close. OK, so. It wasn't my intention to become a racial justice storyteller. It all came about through me researching uh, for my PhD into the psychological lived experiences of former black male gang members before, during and after gang involvement. What took me by surprise, shock should I say, is that how the material, how I became affected by the material, the interviews. And what had come from the interviews was um, lived experiences of racism, as well as institutional racism. And it evoked and triggered flashbacks of my own personal experiences of racism and institutional racism. To the degree that I even struggled to write about it. However, my supervisors uh, for my PhD at the time um, were three white um, females and they encouraged me to write about my uh, experiences and said, you know, well, Yvonne, you can't necessarily continue with doing this research if you're not going to write about um, your findings, but also be interesting to write about how you became affected by the story. What my uh, supervisors were unaware of at the time, but later became aware of, was the fact that I was racially avoidant. And what, about, what I mean by racially avoidant um, is that I couldn't engage in any topic, discourse or conversation or dispute, whether that was with another black person or a white colleague or friend about race. 
So I found myself in a situation where I started to feel very anxious, panicky, being in white spaces. And you probably can tell from my accent, I'm from up north. Um, and I found it very difficult being in, you know, just being in the university, it got that really, really got that bad. And my supervisors agreed that I must attend at least once every six weeks or I'd have to be removed. So I did, and on those days I suffered with panic attacks. I knew I suffered from depression and anxiety as well as PTSD. So I just want to read to you now um, an extract, which is from my PhD, which gives you a sort of insight into how I was feeling back then. And we're talking about 2011. So I start to feel afraid the moment I hear disgruntled black or white people discuss the issue of race. My adrenaline starts pumping and my heart starts racing. And I feel a slight dizziness in my head. My body and mind alerts the fight, flight or freeze response. However, I cannot fight. My voice feels as though it's been silenced and I no longer have the words to put up a fight. Yes, I am inferior to the white human race. It's, it, it is disturbing to think this just as much as it is to listen to black and white people discuss the issue of race. I desperately want it to go away. I carry those scars from decades ago, you black this, you black that, extremely painful words that I had no choice but to endure. The image of a black fly drowning in milk is how I felt a lot of the times. The feeling inhibits me from feeling, trying to express or clearly, well, the feeling inhibits me from trying to express myself clearly to a white audience or in person or in writing. I know it affects how I'm being judged, so avoidance becomes my best friend as it protects me from painful exposures and also others' reactions. I often ask myself the question, should I go deep enough? Will I explode? If I express my feelings of anger, will I be punished in my viva? So the fear is replaced with avoidance. But I guess I am getting better purely because I am writing these words. Racial avoidance prevents me from sitting with or conveying the feeling of anger, powerlessness and hopelessness until it dissipates. Instead, I become my own internal slave master, battling with the thought that I must now apologise to my white audience should they experience any discomfort or disagree with my words. I'm no, longer to, I'm no longer afraid to admit that, yes, I am fearful of the white audience, but this feeling of inferiority is, in, is controlling my mind and the feeling of equality remains a fantasy in my mind. So that's how I felt back then at the beginning of my research. So um, you probably, most of you would probably know, but uh, for those who don't, um, when you embark on a PhD program, Halfway through, you have to usually sit um, a viva, a provisional viva, where you just either submit a chapter of your thesis or an overview of your thesis. And given the sensitive nature and how I became affected, my supervisors felt that they needed to find somebody that could be sensitive um, because they knew I was quite vulnerable and that my mental health had been impacted. So I left it in their hands. Um, I remember the day um, vividly, you know, I greeted the panel, there was three of them. And I politely said hello. Um, and then suddenly the discontented words from the main committee member started to just come with a barrage of microaggressions and basically kept saying, you know, these people, how dare I give these people power? Who do I think I am? If I'm giving power to people to interpret their lived experience and it just went on. And I was finding myself feeling more and more emotionally broken. Anyway, it came to a break and um, 
I sat with my supervisors who were also in shock. And I remember saying to them, it feels like I've gone through 11 rounds with Mike Tyson and I've got to go back for the 12th round and she's going to finish me off. And I went back in and she finished me off to the degree where she failed me. So I was in a situation that I'd lost control. I felt totally powerless and I didn't have any freedom of expression. My supervisors, bless them, um, they were like my white allies. They were saying, you know what, Yvonne, you held your composure, you didn't retaliate, you didn't become that black stereotype um, and you hold it together so you should be proud of yourself. Anyway, I withdrew and then a month after, I started to ponder with the prospect of returning and redoing um, my proposal. And then I talked myself out of it. And then I remember, thought to myself, okay, let me listen to some of my, some of my interviews. And I came across an interview with Larry Higginbottom and Dr. Reed, and they wrote the book on post-traumatic slave disorder. And I'll always remember his words. Um, he said, I have a daughter who is a counselling psychologist. And every time she used to come home from university, she used to complain about how difficult ex her experiences were. And I used to say to her, you know what? You have no right to complain because your ancestors risked their lives so that you can have the life that you're having now. So you have no right to fail. And I remember at the time thinking, oh my gosh, that's a bit harsh. And then he turned to me and he said, and my advice for you, Yvonne, is just to give your supervisors exactly what they want. And when you get your, your PhD, then you can write and say whatever you want to say. And I remember, you know, mulling that over and keep playing it and playing it over. And then I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to just write what they want me to write. I'm going to take my power back. So what I did um, was I wrote a official um, informal complaint to the university. Uh, about this particular uh, member and thankfully my three white supervisors um, produced witness statements for me um, and they were very supportive although at times it was clearly out of the depth but they were very supportive and I submitted it and the outcome was that you know yes Okay, Yvonne, it's no longer the results of fail, you know, having failed is no longer valid, it's void. But what you're going to have to do is uh, resubmit and go against, go up against a new panel and do a provisional fiver again. Did all of that and, and passed. So when it actually, then actually did the research, because I was able then to uh, devise my own methodology, uh, design and framework where I myself and my co-researchers were able to have power, freedom and control. And I wrote about my whole experience of being in the university um, as I lived through it, not as I conceptualised it, but as I lived through it. So again, it was difficult for them to read it at times. So when it actually come to me actually defending uh, my um, thesis, I got to the point where I thought, you know what, this is not about me having a PhD anymore. This is about me being in a position where I feel I can take control of managing the situation, where I can feel powerful, but also I have the freedom of expression. So I went into, um, again, uh, the structure, usual structure of uh, defending your thesis is that you, you enter into the room and um, you enter into the room and uh, the committee members, which there were three, would ask you questions. 
And before the question started, I interrupted and I said, can I speak first? And it was said that that's not how it happens. And we usually talk first. And I said, what I need to get across is that my work is innovative. You've read my thesis and you understand that it will go against my ethos if you take the control. So they said, OK, have, to have the platform. And I said, what is important also is that when you read my thesis, you'll be projecting, you'll be projecting your history, your background, your position, your entitlement. So therefore, I want you to be mindful because it may be that I'll reflect this back to you. And then from there on, is that thanks, thank you for letting us know. It all seemed a bit of a blur. And then we took a break, came back in, and the main committee member said, Yvonne, you wrote an interesting piece of research. Um, and I now want to congratulate you, Dr. Williams. And I was so shocked because I never expected that. And he said, you know, I'm going to email you with the feedback, but I'm only going to give you minor corrections, which can be turned around in two weeks. And he said, in the years I've been doing this, no one's ever challenged the status quo and done what you've done. So congratulations. And that was the day I always remember feeling so powerful, so in control of the situation. And I had the freedom of expression. So that is my story. So I now want to open up um, the platform and have a conversation with the audience, with yourselves. And as I said to you previously, it doesn't have to be about race. It can be any situation where one may have felt powerlessness um, or a loss of control or felt silenced. Um, but just to open up this uh, conversation so that we're all in a position to have a voice. Okay. So, Harry. Hello. Hello. Sorry, the screen's changed. So, all I can see is now I can see somebody. Everyone seemed to disappear. So, I, I tried to do it so that your view was the biggest while you were speaking, and I was uh, uh, fumbling around a little bit because I was more listening, oh. more listening to you than doing my job, probably. Um, but yes, oh. we, the, the, the chat is open, so we'd like to hear people's comments and thoughts. Would you like us to reflect first and play the music? No, the music can be played towards okay. the end. I'll just let you know, uh, Harry, when to play the music. First of all, I just want to invite people, you know, if they want to ask questions or they want to say something themselves, which is not um, aligned with the topic, but also aligned with the need to have freedom, power and, and control. Thank you. Especially given our, you know, our history as black people and the importance that, you know, we can say, you know, we can wait for, you know, institutes or the government to do it for us. But ultimately, we are responsible for ourselves. And it is about what we can do to help us move forward. I think your, your story displayed that so well about, you know, how how hard it can feel to even step forward and ask for something that feels different or or, mm -hmm. or or outside of the norm when your experience is different and outside of the norm all, all of ours is we've, mm -hmm. we've all got individual experience that deserves to be heard um there's so many institutional processes that screw it down to being in this rigid certain way i've certainly heard a lot of this from our customers around 
the pandemic and working from home or working from an office, who's in charge, who's telling me what's what and where to go. Claire says here in the chat, and to everyone, the chat's open, type in it, ask any questions, make any comments. Um, I saw so many of you giving your initial reactions using the emojis, which I think is the kind of way of us celebrating that kind of thing of our time. But your words are, uh, I think what, what Yvonne's done is particularly beautiful in, in sharing that story about taking the stage and taking the platform um, and asking for it and is now opening it up to us all. Um, if you'd prefer to be unmuted and just speak, that's more comfortable for you. Just let me know in the chat and I can send a little invite for you to invite yourself. There's, there's quite a few of us, so I can't leave it open for people to press unmute themselves. Otherwise, we'll end up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Helen says here in the chat, what a fantastic story and congratulations on your achievement. My question is, how can white allies offer our support without taking up space or centering ourselves? <laughs> It's interesting, that question, because I, I would never be able to answer it. And the only reason I can answer it is because the person that allowed me to do things like this and take up space uh, rather than be racial avoidant was um, a white um, Afri um, American lady who I met in New York. And she ran groups of being uh, with other whites and being white allies. And I attended a, I had a scholarship, attended a scholarship um, for urban bushwomen. And I was there for like 10 days. And the attendees, majority of us were people of color, but some people were white. And it was interesting just to see how white allies functioned because in any sort of dispute or if, a, you know, if there was a situation where someone was unhappy outside of the venue, it would always be a white ally that would go up and try to resolve the situation. Um, or if it was a case of, you know, we would go out and um, we would enter it, you know, go to a cafe for coffee um, before we would enter, we, before we reconvened, um, and the receptionist or the person at the till would automatically gravitate to um, serve the white person. Um, the white person would say, "Can you please serve? You we, you saw us both come up. Can you please serve um, Yvonne because she she was here first. So in every situation where they would witness a sort of injustice or a situation where they felt that that person was treated unfairly, they would speak up. Just like my white supervisors, I mean, they were clearly out of the depth, I was out of my depth too, but they did what was right. And I know not every situation is going to work out the same way mine did, but it helped massively um, that they were there to support. So going back to that question is it's, it is about being mindful of the fact that, you know, people of colour or black people are sometimes subjected to discrimination in your presence. And sometimes it is about being the one that stands up and say, no, that's not quite correct or please can you revise what you've just said there or can you please talk to this person um, or it's okay I will deal with this and that to me is not taking up space but having said that somebody else of colour could say that is taking up space so it's all subjective and all relative at the end of the day but that is my experience. Thank you. Great question. Paul Stevenson in the chat here said hit the nail on the head it's about doing what is right and that's going to be different in each context, I guess. Um, we've had a request from Vanessa to unmute and ask a question. So I've just sent you a request, Vanessa. Um, can you hear us and can we hear you? Hi. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Vanessa. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, I just wanted to um, respond to everything you said because I, I found it really powerful but also like really validating especially when you said 
about being racially avoidant because I am um, that well that's my experience for most of my life and then there's the whole there's a lot of shame that comes with that as well so I get a bit nervous even about coming to this today I've not been in a great place and I just thought and then obviously Black History Month, which is fantastic. But for me, it just makes me really anxious, to be honest. And then I feel guilt and then I feel shit. And then I kind of go around in that cycle. And I didn't know what, why that was. I didn't know what that's happening with. Because you're avoiding mm -hmm. it, you don't talk about it. So it that was just really, really helpful. It, yeah, it was really helpful. And I really appreciated everything that, that you've said. Because it is, like you do, it is about power. and. You, there's several themes that kind of go along with that especially when mm. you're a woman as well and mm. it's shed light on a lot of my experiences and I'm like it is all about the power and the control and that fuels a lot of my anxiety and why I do things in a lot of way and it's just it's going mm -hmm. to be a theme throughout my life because of my demographic and because of my experiences so I'm really grateful for everything that you've said and it's helped it's like I've got like hope because I'm like, oh, if she's been able to do all of this and now she's talking about it to strangers, maybe that's something that <laughs> I can, I don't know, evolve out of or something like that. So I just really appreciated it and I wanted to say that rather than type it. Thank you, Vanessa. And I'm glad that you felt able to actually say all of this because, as you know, it is anxiety um provoking and it's interesting because i know i don't know if you could feel hear the anxiety in my voice but it was at a stage where i couldn't even speak so i wouldn't even be able to construct the sentences and it's not easy and it's, it's taken me years to get to where i am but the important thing is um to find people who have similar experiences so therefore the shame and the humiliation subsides and it helps as you say helps to validate your experience and and make you know that you're not alone i mean i'm from the north and to be quite honest when i came to london when i was uh, in my early 20s i've never seen so many black people and when i used to tell people my experiences they would say no that didn't happen that didn't happen and I used to say, no, where I came from in the north, you was born in the late 60s, early 70s, there was like no blacks and no Irish. And, <laughs> you know, and I used to always say it was like the Alabama. Um, but yeah, a lot of Londoners was quite baffled with my experience. So this is why I always say it's unique to me. So for even me hearing you say that you also experienced that racial avoidance, it gives me validation too. So thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, and we, we've had a message here in chat from Mary saying thank you for being vulnerable, Yvonne. It's really inspiring, and I, I pass the same thanks on to Vanessa as well. You, know, you did exactly the same thing. You, mm. you sent a message saying I'd like to be unmuted, um, mm. and you know that takes a huge amount of strength in a session of gosh, over a hundred or so people. And it starts there. So the process uh, for you, Vanessa, has already started. So it is about keep moving forward with that. We've had a quick question um, from Margaret saying, thank you so much for sharing your story, Yvonne. Can you repeat the name of the book you read? Oh, Post-Matic Slave Syndrome. Sorry, Disorder, not Syndrome, because there's quite a few what says um, Syndrome, but it's Disorder. And it's by Dr. Reed and um, Larry Higginbottom. And it's a small book. It's a small book, easy read. They're from Boston, yeah. I've had a question here from Charlotte in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. It was really powerful. I was intrigued by your point on gaining power through research. I'm interested to know if you continue to do this in your practice or work today. Well, um, any usually um i usually get tend to get referrals um from individuals who have either experienced institutional racism or you know on the verge of feeling of being managed out and i usually tend to specialize in in that so people come to see me um 
to work through that process and to manage the situation, whether they're going through a grievance or it's going to court or, or, or whatever. And that is um, the process that I follow. So even, it's not just with race, even in all situations, it could be being bullied at work, go through the same process. It could be subjected to any form of abuse. It's going through the same process. Um, even with the whole, you know, people, you know, who lost uh, loved ones through COVID. Mm -hmm. Again, going through the, you know, the whole process, because I think it's a very, it's a very powerful way to have a reparative experience because, you know, they'll always, you know, society will always throw things at us that we have no control over as we saw with COVID. Having said that, we have ultimate control over how we choose to manage those situations. And when you get that concept, you're able to think differently. And when you're able to work on yourself and look at where the, you know, where the whole thing originates from, you can make meaning from that situation and then build some sort of cognitive uh, structuring, restructuring to take control of a situation that you felt you lost control over or felt silent. Uh, Evelyn said here in the chat, thank you for sharing Yvonne. It's the first time I've heard how I've been feeling vocalized. So thank you. Um, oh, you that's a really important part of inviting others into these conversations is mm -hmm. to have that opportunity to have what you're feeling, not just vocalized, but validated and understood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul says here, challenging the authorities is difficult enough, but be advised to keep quiet makes it doubly difficult. I'm so happy that you had the strength and sense of justice to challenge them. Naomi says, thank you for sharing your inspirational. In my childhood, I was seen and not heard, not just among society, but also within my family background. So it's great you're speaking out. Hope you share your story, not just to the UK, but also worldwide. I agree. Hopefully we've got some people from outside of the UK here today. We, 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 tend, we tend to as well. I've got a question here uh, that's been sent privately. I've seen examples of racism and have wanted to say something. However, I found it difficult to come up with the right words to say. Each experience is different and I don't seem to be able to think on the spot and say the right thing. I feel like I need a toolkit that I can draw on. Does such a toolkit exist, Ivan? <sighs> No, it's interesting you say that. Um, I always remember the hardest thing, and anyone who's done a degree, masters or whatever, anytime you'd have to submit a chapter and your supervisor, tutor, give you feedback, it would be so excruciating. And I always remember the feedback, this is not making sense, Yvonne, this is not making sense. And I'm like, well, of course it's not going to make sense because I'm in a state of confusion. When you're in a state of confusion or things uh, don't appear as clear or you don't have that clarity, things are messy. So you shouldn't expect to speak eloquently. It's like, you know, if I have a client and a client's distressed and she comes and sees me or he comes and sees me and they always apologise and say, sorry, I'm not making sense. And I'm like, you're making perfect sense. I don't expect you to speak. So it is about accepting that whatever comes out of my mouth is good enough because that reflects how I'm feeling. So if it's messy, if it's inarticulate, if it's fluid, whatever, it reflects the space that I'm in. So toolbox, no, it, it will just come. So you have to trust yourself and accept that it's okay to feel the way you feel. I had a comment here from Carol that says, in the realm of domestic abuse, power and control tend to be perceived as negatives. So exciting to think of them as positives to be gained along with freedom. Such a powerful sentence and written mm. poetically, Carol, actually. Uh, that, I got sort of a lot of images as it came to mind as I read that one. So thank you for sharing that. 
Um, someone's asked here privately, thank you for sharing. How do you deal with institutional racism? I'm shocked by the bullying and aggressions by some white staff in schools to students and parents. And if you complain of bad treatment, the head or principal claims zero tolerance and supports the staff member. You know what, it's a, it's a difficult um, question to answer because everyone has different circumstances and every institute is different. And this is why I always say, you know, you know, depending on the institute and depending on the individuals, you know, if if you know that you can trust your HR, then there's always a policy and procedure that has to be followed. And the fact that if you can follow that procedure, you know, on some level, you should be heard. Whether you get the outcome you deserve, you know, that's a different different thing. But I always put it um, down to the fact that, you know, racism exists, institutional racism exists. It's a fact, facts don't change. It's evidence-based. The difficulty is, is the emotions and our experiences that get caught up in that. And if we struggle emotionally, as I did in my first experience, I struggled emotionally and I couldn't articulate myself. I didn't trust that the system would, would listen to me first, first and foremost, and I withdrew. But it's when you have that strength and determination, but also the allies around you and like-minded people that can say, you know what, you are making sense. What you've said did happen. Don't question yourself. Those are the facts. And once you can begin to manage your mental health, then the execution is much, much more manageable because every company, um, every company has a duty of care. And the only dif the, dif the difficulty is, is that most cases where people have experienced institutional racism or um, at work have been settled at work or in court and there's been a non or non-disclosure. So no one never hears about it. And when I do these talks, or I always have to tell people, you know, because people say, oh, you know, Yvonne, it's easier said than done. And I say, yes, that's true. But in my experience, I hear it all the time, but I can never talk about it. But I hear that, you know, people do get justice, but it's been signed with a non-disclosure. And the, t the reason they get justice is because they stick to what the handbook has said, which has been written by the organisation. And their execution is always referenced to evidence-based. So when you're in that position where you're not doubting yourself and you are feeling confident, you're better in managing that situation. But unfortunately for many of us, and given experiences, that many of us, many black people experience, we tend to think that, you know what, they're never gonna believe us or they're just gonna shove it under the carpet or say that we're overreacting or that that didn't happen. And yes, that is, you know, all of that above is, is true, but it's important to remember that facts don't change, evidence doesn't change. Um, and whenever someone's written in a handbook, it's a legal document and everything has to be aligned and nobody, nobody, no company, if, if they're thinking clearly enough, is going to allow an individual or individuals to take the company down. So it is about, first of all, allowing yourself um, to work on your own mental health and your own confidence. And that's the most important. Thanks. Oh, We've probably got about just under another 15 minutes. We've got another couple of questions, if that's okay. Yes. Great. Um, 
Beatrice says, thanks for sharing. One of the things you mentioned in your stories is that your supervisor commented that you didn't become the black stereotype in regards to the way you responded. I wonder whether this is something you often think about at work and how do you navigate having the power and freedom to express your valid emotions without the fear of being stereotyped as the usual tropes of angry, aggressive, etc. I mean, now I accept that's how a lot of people will view it. But as I say to many of my clients who come for support or advice or coaching, that this is a situation usually, you know, employees will always tell you, take out the emotion, take out the emotion. But this is a highly emotional situation. You know, if somebody, well, somebody um, had a road traffic accident and they were suffering from PTSD and they're feeling anxious and agitated and angry about a situation, they would be saying to them, you know, stop being emotional, stop being emotional. They would validate their emotions and they'll do everything possible to ensure that they feel safe returning back to work. Now, living through institutional racism is no different. So I work with the same principle. It's no, it's no different and it should be seen the same. So irrespective of whether I'm perceived as an angry black person or I show too much passion or, oh my gosh, if one's a bit teeful, I don't care. <laughs> because that's the manifestations, it's emotions and it's valid. I, I really like that comparison there um, to any other event that's gonna affect us emotionally. Mm. Why are suddenly emotions invalid when it's about racial injustice or racial abuse and mistreatment? But you know, if someone was being bullied at work, you'd understand their emotions. What? Why would it be any any different at all? Thank you. Mm. We had a private comment here, this which is one that I've heard quite a lot actually. Mm -hmm. The problem is you cannot normally trust the HR department. As a black person who feels the pain of being unfairly treated and who lacks the control of keeping quiet, you're then labelled as aggressive when all you're trying to do is fight your corner. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it was a question, but I, I think a, a, a comment I often hear around lack of mm -hmm. trust in human resources or, or lack of trust in the very institutions that feel racist. Mm -hmm. Of course, and that's why I'll always overemphasize the fact that only if you trust, you know, just because they're, you know, HR and they have a duty of care, they're human beings at the same time and it's not everyone we can trust. Having said that, again, it goes back to your mental, um, how you're feeling uh, emotionally and your esteem and, you know, uh, if you're feeling self-assured. Because um, again, irrespective, and I keep saying, doesn't matter, irrespective of whatever they're saying, facts are facts. And at some point they have to listen, but it's how it's executed is, is the hardest part. But yes, that, you know, that, you know, they are right. And this is unfortunately why many people just don't say anything. But it's just unfortunate that a lot of situations are not talked about because of non-disclosures. So. Yeah, I think it really hurts people not having those other stories to, to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to see that it's possible, to mm. see the inner workings of how it goes. Because I think anxiety will increase so much more if you don't even know what the process is going to be and what it's going to look like. Yeah. Um, Jane said here in the chat, I appreciate that comparison. I think we're talking about your comparison of the road traffic accident. Yeah. And I hate, I hate the take out the emotion response, an idea we can't show emotion at work. Who mm -hmm. made that rule? Um, <laughs> and and it, isn't, it isn't really a rule. We see emotion at work all the time. Emotion yeah. is celebrated when it's positive emotion in the workplace. And to have the positive emotion, you must mm -hmm. accept that the negative exists as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen says, thank you, Yvonne, for sharing your experiences in such an open way. There's a lot to think about on a personal level and also in my work. I'd be interested in reading more about your research. Do you have anywhere we can go to, to find that? 
Uh, this is always a question people ask. Um, because uh, my research was quite deemed quite com uh, controversial, um, but also I wrote about my lived experience, which involved my family members, my son. I put it on a um, embargo, oh, so it can't. So if someone wants to look at it, they have to request it. And I have to give authorization because I've wrote about close family members and I don't feel comfortable with sharing their experiences. Um, but, you know, if it's the right person and, and the reason they want to use it, I have released it and they can look at it. So, yes, it's in, you know, it's in the British Library, but it will say um, send an email if you want to have a look. And uh, the title's called uh, Blackface with an Invisible White Mask. What's a moving title? Uh, Karen, uh, oh, that was a question from Karen. So Monica says here, if we can show we're happy about something, what's wrong showing angry about something that's upset mm. us? Yeah. And Alice said the emotional comments are often directed towards women by men, as if it's a negative thing to have emotions. It can be incredibly frustrating. Helen comments, even negative emotion is celebrated at work from the right people. Things like being aggressive with sales or not suffering fools. Really good point, Helen. Yeah. Yeah. When it's about making the uh, institution money, it can, you know, <laughs> ruthlessness and, 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 and that kind of pressure can be really celebrated. Good point. No, I can't hear you. It, sh it should pop up saying, there we go. Oh, okay. That's it. Okay, I'm here again. Sorry, I'm not savvy when it comes to this <laughs> technology. Not so, um, having reflected, um, does anybody have um, any words or word that will sum up their experience of this seminar, uh, webinar, should I say? Had a few people reflecting already. Can you see the chat, Yvonne, or would you like me to read them? I out? can see, but it's too quick for me to read. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, well, Claire says, thank you so much, Yvonne, and everyone else for sharing. Really glad I joined. What a great way to end the, de the session. Uh, um, and then Sarah oh, is moving fast. Well, I, empowering, empowered, I'm seeing quite a lot, inspirational, courage. Um, Sarah put something a little longer. I have no experience, lived experience of what you've described, but you've described it so well, even your obvious nervousness, that I feel truly humbled. Thank you for, so much for being so open and honest. I think the issues you've raised, I will think of the issues you've raised frequently. Thank you. Doing what's right, says, yeah. Um, yeah, lots of people saying inspirational, and I think, you know, thinking carefully about what that word inspirational means, I'm being inspired, something is coming into me, I'm taking something from what's being said today, and it's going to move me forward in a different way. Kim and just says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is it. So, you know, often enough, you know, we, we tend to do, you know, webinars or talks and things just tend to be over but what's important now is what you're going to take from this and how you're going to move it forward whether that's in your own personal life whether that's in your work life or in your relationship uh, so it's about being reflexive in your thinking so it doesn't just end um, here today but thank you for inviting me and you've all been wonderful attendees and I wish you all um, good health and I'm sure you've got my um, website address with emails if you need to ask any questions um, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah lovely I'll put, I'll, I'll put a link again here into the uh, into the chat of the YouTube channel so we'll upload the recording oh, of this. Um, yeah and we'll put we'll put a link to your to your site there in the description but i just want to read out some of the other things for people there's people saying the speech gave me courage um a hard topic to talk about and i find it hard to talk because i'm afraid of saying the wrong things um 
so important to have these open discussions. Beatrice saying reclaiming power. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. Peace, freedom, liberty, and thank you. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah, Julie says, please carry on what you're doing. You're such a great role model. And Mary says, I've been reminded that as a black woman, I have freedom, power and control over things that concern me. Indeed you do. <laughs> so, yeah, I just want to echo the thanks that everyone is shouting in the chat. Um, thank you so much, uh, Yvonne, for, for hosting this and for taking on that difficult position continually over and over again of putting yourself out there in front of people and talking about this um and thanks for bringing it to us at cic and all, and, and all of our, our yeah, um, thank you it's been a pleasure um but yes so i bid you all a good day and keep moving forward with that freedom power and control <laughs>